season. Yay! Yay! And so I thought it would be an awesome night to be able to sit together at a table, really just what is better than sitting at a table with those you love? And just being able to sit there. I know my favorite thing is just eating dinner with my family and talking about our days, talking about our high and our low of our day and stuff. So I thought with all the craziness coming up, you know it's that time where there's, there's I have to say yes to this, no to this, where are we going to be able to make it to this and then run to the next thing? We need to sit and feast on the word, amen? we got to fill ourselves up. And so um, I hope you love your invitation that's on the table. Does everybody see their invitation? Because here's the thing. Everyone is invited to the feast. Everyone is invited. And you'll see by the empty seats, not everybody accepts the invitation. God invites all of us to the feast, but not everybody accepts the invitation. So congratulations. Welcome to the feast, y'all. So glad you accepted the invitation. So we're going to talk about a wedding feast tonight. Have you ever been to a wedding? We've all been to weddings, right? Yes. And I got to go to an amazing wedding just a week ago or a week and a half or something. Can we please have Miss Demi Frazier, please? You know, the ice made into a heart or anything. She didn't do that. Don't worry about it. But listen, it was amazing because all the people that she, they loved were there. The people that they loved. I was, when I heard that they had invited over 400 people to their wedding, I thought, I don't even think I know 400 people. But they had over 400 people invited to their wedding, and they had over 300 at their wedding. It was a huge wedding, and it was awesome. And Tommy and I were the DJs. Mojams. Mojams Entertainment. Okay? We're the DJs you call when you don't want to pay a real DJ. Okay? That's us. That was me and Tommy. All right? So, yeah, this was a huge wedding. Huge, and it was so awesome. And there were over 20-some tables to get through the buffet line. Okay? So... That was mine and Tommy's job for, for the blank stairs to look at us while we said, table one and two, you can go get your food, right? It was like, okay, so here they go through the line, here they go. And Tommy's starting to notice, he's like, they need more people in the buffet line, right? Because it was so delicious. The food was so delicious, but, but they were like, we, Tommy, so what does Tommy do? Leave the DJ table, go over, put some gloves on, grabs another guy and was like, you're serving green beans. Okay, so stood behind there and made it four instead of two so Tommy could get these people through the line and it worked out awesome. And I was like, that's what you do because weddings are about the people you love being there. Amen? That's what you do. And it turned out to be amazing. So we're going to we're gonna just celebrate tonight by talking about a wedding that was in the work. Okay? So we're going to be in, um, we're going to talk about in Luke 14, Jesus and he's talking about a wedding. So let's go to um, Luke 14. I don't even know if that's the number. There we go. Angel, what's my number up there? Thank you. One through six. Okay. Didn't look it on my sheet. So, okay. So, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from a normal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful? to heal on the Sabbath or not, but they remained silent. So, taking hold of the man, he healed them and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. He said, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host will have invited both of you. They will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, to take, when you're invited, take the lowest place. So when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to the host,
close, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they can't repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So let's stop here for a minute, because I want to talk about the big H word that Jesus is getting ready to talk about here. Humility, right? Jesus is like, he's in a room with a bunch of Pharisees, and these people screamed, not humble, right? They wore the robes, and they wore, they made sure that they were praying on corners so everyone could see them doing their deeds on the corners. They took the best seat of honor. These Pharisees were not humble at all, and they bugged the crap out of Jesus. Let's be honest, okay? He, want y'all, if you've ever heard me speak, I'm very real. Sorry, this is, I use words like crap. Sorry about that. Okay, so he, but he was like, listen, stop exalting yourself. Let God exalt you. Humility is so beautiful. Humility says, here, you can take my seat. I'll sit in the back. Humility says there's not enough workers to serve the food and we got 300 people, so I'm going to go stick some gloves on and go work the food table, right? That's humility. Humility is a Jesus trait. The word says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The word says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And then humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Okay, y'all, Lucifer was the opposite of humble, right? Where did that land him? Not so good, right? God had to say, no, sorry, I'm going to have to humble you. Because um, for those who exalt themselves, they have to be humbled. And he hum those who humble themselves will be exalted. So I want to tell you something. I, you know, I think that some of the most important roles here at Unforsaken, we've been doing Unforsaken for six years now. It's crazy. We've been in, um, this is our third location, right? Third? Yes, this is our third location. We have done it forsaken for so long, and we have had such amazing leaders since the beginning. And some of the most difficult tasks here, some of the most important tasks, are the ones behind the scenes that nobody sees. I want to talk about Annie for a second because she hates when I talk about her. And it's just fun, too, okay? Annie's my little sister, but Annie has the gift of hospitality. Yes, she does. Annie makes sure that the table is always set for us. She always puts out a spread. She always makes sure that we have food. We have gifts, the giveaways. Annie makes sure of that, that she always says, what's the theme next month? She loves a theme. Hospitality people love a theme, right? So that is, but if, people might think, oh, that's not the hardest job. But let me tell you something. When Annie can't make it because of one of her kids' games or something, oh, we realize what Annie does. We're just like, somebody get me down. We need coffee. We look. We, like the rest of us are flubbering idiots, okay? It's like Annie. It does what like four or five people do because she's anointed in hospitality. But that is one of the more humble roles here. You don't see Annie on the stage. You don't see her, her up here doing that. And then there's Angel. That's Angel holding one of her babies over there. She is literally, her name is perfect for her. Yes, it is. Because Angel is my angel. She's my assistant in the ministry in all areas. And you never see. Angel does the invites. She does the the order of events. She makes sure that the worship is set up, the PowerPoints, the everything behind the scenes. She does all the marketing, the promotion. If it wasn't for Angel, we wouldn't be here. She does all of the setting up the venue, making sure that we, you know, she's the last one on the scene each time the first one here is set up. And she is literally, she's got two preschoolers, okay? Y'all look at her. She's amazing. And But let me tell you, those little angels see what she does all day long. They see her with her little laptop. So, but I'm very grateful for the humble roles here at Unforsaken. And there's so many others that I could go on all day. But the truth is, it takes a lot of humility to make sure the banquet table's set every time. It does. It takes a lot of saying, you know what, i got to do my job behind the scene. Humility allows God to shine. Humility allows God to shine. 
When I was releasing tables at the wedding, this is so funny, I was thinking, when you're on table 17, right, you think the people, you're just like, because you go two at a time, it takes a little while for people to go through, and you're like, table 17's hating being table 17, okay? They're just like, here we are in the corner, table 17. Table 16 down through one have already walked by with their buttered rolls and stuff. They're just like, they're like you know, and then you see, like, the main table's already finished, and you're just like, okay, table 17, 18, and 19, you can go get your food. It's like, but listen, I'm telling you, here's the coolest thing. Guess what it says? In heaven, table 17 goes first. The last will be first, and the first will be last in heaven, so praise God, that is just our Jesus. The DJs eat first in heaven, amen? I'm so excited. But it's so awesome. God loves humility. He loves a humble heart. He says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand, and in due time, he will lift you up. In due time. Matthew 20, verse 16 says, so the last will be first, the first will be last. Humility is huge to God. It's huge. Let's read on. The parable of the great banquet, verse 15. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had already been invited, Come, for everything's now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I just bought a field and I have to go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I am on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you've ordered has been done, but there's still room. The master told his servant, go out to the roads, the country lanes, and compel them to come in so my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So verse 16 says a certain man was preparing a banquet, and here's the truth. God has prepared a banquet for us. He's preparing right now a banquet for us in heaven. It is amazing. John 14, 2 through 4 says, My Father's house has many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and welcome you into my presence so that you may also be where I am. You know the place to where I'm going. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And here's the thing. Ladies, we know the way, right? We know the way to the place where we're going. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. The word says no one comes to the Lord but through Jesus. We enter into the gates of heaven when we take our last breath here on earth only because of Jesus and always because of Jesus. God's not going to change his plan A. He's not going to change his plan A. Jesus is God's plan A. He always has been. He says, if you want to be there with me in heaven someday, you better know my son. You better know my son. He's the gate. He's the way. He's the life. He's the word. He's everything. Father God puts all his eggs in the Jesus basket. He does. Ain't no other way to get the invite to the banquet but through knowing Jesus personally. The host of the banquet has prepared for us. Father God has prepared for us. Unforsaken women takes preparation every month. We've said that it takes a lot of preparation. And here's the thing. We've, we've done this for so long. When we first started doing Unforsaken, we would do all our plans. And I'm telling you, the next day, I had like an Unforsaken hangover because I was so tired, right? I mean, you're tired the next day because you're just like, set up, clean up, do all that, you know. And we were still kind of working out our kinks the first year. And so when you put on an event, guess who you expect to be there? Your closest family and friends, right? You have this unwritten guilt rule, right? Like, my sisters better be there, right? That's like what it is. You have this. You don't even know you've got it in your heart, but you do. And so the first, like, couple years, couple, I'd say the first whole year of Unforsaken, if some, one of my closest friends or family didn't show up, I would go home and all I could think about was who wasn't there. 
Who wasn't there? There would be a room, we'd have 40 sometimes, we'd have 100 sometimes, and I'd be like, hmm, Aunt Patty wasn't there, or whatever, you know what I mean? I'd be like, oh, Aunt Patty is in New York, you know what I mean? I'd be like, it didn't matter, I just had like somebody, right? But the truth is, I had this like in my heart until I realized that was the enemy. That was the enemy causing offense in me. And so it was something I had to kind of put to death in me because I had to realize, um, nope, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be happy with who shows up to I'm forsaken. And I told God I would do it for 10, and God's like, okay, so there, we really never only had 10, but he, there's been some months where you're like, we've had 20, we've had whatever, and it's like, okay, God, I told you I would. And so, but then the next month we've got 100. You know, it's just, it just depends. But my point is, he, uh, what does the man say? He says, well, they won't taste my banquet. Right? That's what he says. That's what the owner says. And I recognize that was me. But I've gotten to the point that I'm forsaken when I've realized. I feel like I have to say, they just don't get to taste the banquet. They miss when they don't get here to unforsaken. Amen? It's the truth. But Tommy and I are like that about church. We're very serious about showing up to church diligently. We are. Yes, there's weeks that we are just like, okay, we're either traveling or somebody's sick and we'll watch online or that kind of thing. And it's not because I think I'm scoring points in heaven because it doesn't matter to God. We are the church. Amen? Amen. It's because I know that there are hardworking people all week long that are preparing a banquet for us. There are hardworking staff members. There's hardworking volunteers that are preparing and expecting us there. We're faithful because God's expecting us. God's expecting us. He says, I want my house full. That's what the father of the banquet says. So God's expecting us. So Tommy used to say, and he would tell the boys if they didn't want to go to church or Sarah, he'd go, okay, um, you know, when you don't show up for church, it's kind of like your mom prepared dinner. She invited you to dinner. She set the table. She did all the cooking. She invites you over, and then you don't show up for dinner. And he's like, listen, I have to tell you, my husband was raised Italian mother, okay? He was raised with spaghetti with a side of guilt. And you will, he was bathed in, learned to respect, okay? And so Tommy's like, oh, we get to church, right? So we know how to give them the, if mama makes dinner, you show up for dinner, right? So that's where we are with church. We've given that to our kids before. But that's why we decided we want our father's house full. We want it, because, and then he says that in verse 23. He says, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so my house will be full. We understand the master of the house is God, right? We understand that. We understand the banquet is held in heaven. We understand the invitation is given to all, don't we? But that there's also a certain dress code. And we're like, what? No, God is like, come as you are. No, nope. there is also a dress code in heaven. And we're going to go there for a second. You have to have on your wedding clothes to get into the wedding banquet of heaven. Let's turn to Matthew. And in Matthew, the book of Matthew, 22, verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell them who've been invited that I prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet's ready, but those I invited didn't deserve to come, so go to the street corners, invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man that was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked him, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Let me tell you where the weeping and gnashing of teeth could be on this stage, because it's hotter than Hades up here. I'm just telling you, okay? I'm like, good lord, it's hot up here, okay? But there's a lot of similarities in this one. 
to the other gospel, right? <laughs> These lights, I think, are from hell right now, okay? I'm sorry. But there's a lot of similarities to the other gospel. He invited everyone, right? He invited them all. He set a place for them. This is There's the similarities in all of this. But um, this one talks about the wedding clothes. So what are the wedding clothes? They're actually a robe. They're actually a robe. It's called our robe of righteousness. We wear our robes of righteousness because of Jesus. We are clothed correctly for the feast in heaven when we wear the garments of righteousness. We're clothed in white. The coolest thing about the wedding in heaven, everybody gets to wear white, right? You can't find a cute little thing at Bell's and be like, no, can't wear it because you can't wear white to a wedding, right? But you get to in heaven, we all get to wear white. Guess why? Because we're all the bride. We're all the bride in heaven. The church is his bride. We're the bride of Christ and we're all dressed in white at the wedding banquet. Just think about that. Isaiah 61.10 says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he's clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Revelation 19.8-9 reads, let us rejoice and celebrate and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has, been, has made herself ready. She was given clothing of fine linen, linen bright and pure, for the fine linen she wears is the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel told me to write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, Those are the true words of God. Ladies, the Lord is who clothes us for the wedding in heaven. The Lord is whose righteousness we take. The word tells us in other areas that our works are like filthy rags apart from Jesus. Our works, our best day, our best day, serving at unforsaken treasures, right? Working our little tails off, our doing good, doing good, doing good, without our robes of righteousness on, it's filthy rags. Jesus is who clothes us for, for our wedding feast in heaven. And here's the thing. We think it's important to say yes to the dress here on earth. Come on, y'all, right? It's even more in heaven. We have to say yes to the dress to get into heaven. Amen? We better say yes to the robe of righteousness that Jesus offers us. That robe is what we'll be wearing to the wedding. That robe is fresh and clean and pure and white. And it's what makes us stand clean in front of a perfect God. We have to say yes to the dress here on earth if we want to wear the robe in heaven. We only have this life to say yes. We only have it. And if you have not said yes and amen yet, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to say yes to your robe of righteousness. The owner of the banquet, Father God, has invited us. He's invited everyone. The word says that it's not his will that any shall perish, but all shall come to repentance. He wants all of us at the banquet. There's rooms. He's prepared a place for us. He's preparing a place for us. And there is room. There's many rooms in his house. But not all will secure their reservation. He's given us special clothes to wear. But not all will say yes to the dress. People will allow excuses and worldly pleasures to keep them from accepting God's invitation. They will. Jesus dealt with this when he's calling those to follow him since the beginning. Now we're in Luke 9, verses 58 through 62. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. 
Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Mark 10, 29 says, Peter began to say to him, look, we've left everything and followed you. Truly, I tell you, said Jesus, no one who's left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake for the gospel will fail to receive a hundredfold in the present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields along with persecutions. He throws that one right in there, right? And to receive eternal life in the age to come. Does Jesus want us to alienate our loved ones to follow him? No, he's not saying that. God is serious about us. He, God loves the family. He, one of his Ten Commandments is honor your mother and father, right? He's not saying that, but what he's saying here is, I got to be first. I have to be first. He, we have to, all other relationships here on earth have to play second fiddle to our relationship with Jesus Christ. They do. When we love Jesus first and best, all our other relationships are even better. They're much better. The Apostle Paul understood the cost of discipleship. He was a man who enjoyed great prominence among the Jewish elite, but he forsook all of it for the love of Christ. He declares, what things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is through God by faith. Paul accepted his invitation to the wedding. He accepted his robe of righteousness. He put it on and he never looked back. He said, I consider it all trash. It's all trash compared to my robe. We see this at the wedding feast. When the guests were invited and they declined, their excuses were, I just bought some land, right? I just bought some land. I really need to go check on the land. Or I just bought some oxen. I have to first go take care of the oxen, right? And, and, and Or I just got married. I got to check with my husband or I got to check with my wife. And guess what? We do the same, y'all. We do the same. I get, you know, it's, it's, here's the thing, we do, it's like, we give, like, Jesus said, love you, but I'm just a little too busy right now, right? I'm a little too busy for this invitation to pick up my cross and follow you, because I got to work, right? Because I got to work, and, and I got to work on Sunday, so, you know what, sorry, Mo, that's not going to work for me, the Sunday service there, but, you know, pray for me, Thank, pray for me, okay, Mo, and how about, how about my kids, they are busy, I live in the car, I'm mom's taxi, I'm just so busy, we got all our sports activities on the weekend, just sorry about that. So, um, but hey, I love what you're doing, right? Love what you're doing there. Yep. It's here's the thing. We do this, and then we say things like, "My husband. Oh, I found him. He's my soulmate. He's my everything. I'm complete now, right? My soulmate. Hello, right? Think again, okay? Think again. Here's my answer to all this. Nope, not good. Change your reply to. Check one, I will be at the wedding banquet. Amen? Change your reply. Check one for the invite. My friends, don't let life get in the way of the giver of life. Don't let it. Don't let stuff get in the way of the Lord who owns all the stuff. It's all his. It's all his anyways. Don't let your children get in the way of the one who gave you those children. Don't let your soulmate who completes you be anyone but Jesus Christ. Amen? He is Mr. Wonderful. Take it from me, these other things are cheap substitutes, and they will let you down. They'll let you down. But if we can check yes, we want in. Yes and amen, I'm coming to the wedding, right? I'm following Jesus. I want my seat. These other things can be idols, and let me tell you what they do. They steal your eternal home. They steal it from you because we've learned this here in Unforsaken. Idols are dedicated to your destruction. They're dedicated to your destruction. So don't do it. Remember that. So just like for Demi's wedding, invitations went out. 
Invitations go out every day. Invitations go out every day, y'all. We're giving invitations, inviting people. Those of you who've invited friends to Unforsaken, you invite friends to church. Those are the invitations, y'all. The invitations are going out. Preparations were made, and Demi's parents and her wedding coordinator made. You found the venue, and they prepared the venue. And God is preparing for us right now. And the people that showed up had on their wedding clothes. And you will, in heaven, have on your wedding clothes. The wedding feast in heaven is going to be worth the wait. It's going to be worth the wait. It'll be better than any party, wedding feast, anything we've ever been to. Even if Mojam's Entertainment was the, was the awesome DJs, it will be better. Okay? It's going to be amazing. It's going to put any other venue to shame. It'll be worth casting down any idols we have to here on earth to say, I want more and more of Jesus. I'm going to just cast it down. It's a good thing, but it's not the best thing. The best thing is pursuing my King of Kings, my Lord of Lords. Amen? And those other things. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things get added to it. We get to enjoy the love of our family. We get to enjoy amazing jobs. We get to enjoy awesome sporting events with our kids. We get to enjoy all those things as long as they're not the thing in our life. Jesus has to be the thing. The wedding feast in heaven will be glorious and magnificent and perfect just like Jesus. And we're going to dance. I know we'll dance. Heaven will be a celebration of... It'll be the celebration of every invitation that was handed out here on earth, every invitation that was accepted here on earth. I love when you hear of people who have gone into heaven and come back, and they say the people who shared Jesus with them were there waiting for them. Their second grade Sunday school teacher, or their whatever it was, that they get to greet them in heaven. And so many similar stories like that, and that just excites me. I pray that we get to do that. Let's listen to a little imagery about heaven here. If you want to close your eyes, you can, but this is just, this is in Revelation. Chapter 7, verses 13 through 17. It says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They've been washed. Their robes are, and they have been washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We have so much to look forward to. But we have to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. We have to become heaven-minded. We have to think about heaven, y'all, because it's going to be spectacular. It's going to be worth the wait. So thank you for accepting your invitation tonight. We're thankful you joined us. And now we want to just do something when we're at a table. We should remember that when Jesus broke Jesus' body, how he broke for us. So we're going to have communion tonight. We're going to remember the Last Supper. You're going to see the bread in the cup. There's some bread on your table if you all would like to take a piece of bread. And you have your cups. Tonight, we're going to take the elements together. We don't do this every time in Unforsaken, but we do it for special occasions. And so, communion is a time of remembering Christ, remembering his sacrifice for us, remembering his resurrection, remembering him. And so, part of remembering him is thankfulness, amen? And so tonight was all about being thankful and just remembering everything from, Lord, thank you for giving me breath of life. Thank you for getting me up out of bed this morning. Thank you, Lord, that my feet are working. Thank you, God, that I'm able to speak tonight. Thank you, God, for my home, my family. Thank you, God, for all of our food and our blessings. But I want to take a moment right now, and I want us to um, have some silent prayer right now. 
and just offer up to him some thankfulness. If you want to get your heart right, maybe there's just something that's just bothering you that you're like, Lord, I need to give this to you. I need to lay it at the cross right now. Whatever it is, this is a good time. Let's just take a second. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. Claim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, we just, we just praise you, God. We thank you for what you did on the cross. We just praise you and thank you for what Jesus did on the cross for us. Jesus, we thank you that you are the bread of life. You are the word made flesh. We thank you that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. We thank you that the Lord is the stronghold the righteous run to and are safe. We thank you, Lord, for the peace that passes all understanding. God, we thank you that even though Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy, you came so that we may have life and have it in abundance until it overflows. Thank you, God, that you're the giver of every good and perfect gift. Thank you, God, that you are the Alpha, you're the Omega, you're the beginning, you're the last. God, we thank you that we're able to lift our eyes to the hills. That's where our help comes from, the maker of heaven and earth. Lord, we thank you that we that dwell in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, we thank you that you give our angels charge concerning us that they lift us up in their hands so that we will not strike our foot against a stone. Thank you that your word says we will tread upon the lion and the cobra. We will trample the great lion and the serpent because we love you. Says the Lord, you'll rescue us. God, I thank you for the blessing of Psalm 91 where you say, with long life shall I satisfy you and show you my salvation. Jesus, thank you that by your stripes we are healed. That by your stripes we were healed. That it's finished. We thank you that healing is ours because of what you did on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that we have the power to trample on serpents and and serpents and scorpions, and we're able to overcome all the schemes of the enemy. We thank you that you've given us that authority, Lord. God, we just thank you for the wedding feast in heaven that we have to look forward to. We thank you for our families, God. We thank you for our friends, God. We thank you for our homes, God. We thank you for our food. God, thank you for breath of life. May we do what you want us to, Lord. May we be out there and be ambassadors for you, Lord. 
that we all have the ministry of reconciliation, that we can all go out and be ministers, Lord, showing people to the way, the truth, and the life, because no one comes to the Father except through you. God, I pray right now that if there are people who don't know if they've got a robe, Lord, if they don't know that they own a robe of righteousness, that they are wearing it right now because of the blood of Christ, if they do not know they have this robe, I pray that tonight is the night that they make you Lord and Savior. Your word says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And that salvation is forever. So God, if there's anyone tonight who has never said Jesus is Lord, I pray that tonight they raise their hand and say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. God, I praise you and I thank you, God. I praise you and thank you. Thank you for being the maker of all things our Redeemer, our Sustainer, our Healer, our everything. We love the Lord. In Jesus' name.